I stand firmly in the fact that I'm one of the best to ever do this for the culture, for my coast, and for my city. This is the best rapper in LA podcast. 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 And I'm your host, Merce. 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 What up, though? What up, though? What up, though? Welcome back. This is part two of the Netherworlds episode here on the Best Rapper in LA podcast. If you didn't hear part one, go back, listen. This is episode eight, but welcome back. Maybe we'll play a little bit of Gift of Gabs. Welcome back. As we Back to the days and the times of old. Welcome back to the classic stories that's been told. Welcome back to Diamond Back Fights Painted Back when life Rest in peace to Gift of Gab. And we're gonna pick up here a story that spins off of the song Fat Boys about when Scarab's parents took us to Cancun one summer. And the Fat Boy song say Crenshaw for the summer, Cancun for the break. Scare's parents took me out of the country for the first time. I went to Cancun for my graduation. It was his summer vacation because he was two grades behind me, but I'm the youngest. I, I know I've stated that before. Just don't. I just it's 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 weird. Uh, but we went to Cancun, and that was my mom's gift to me for graduating. Before she found out I graduated with a zero point five, and they were staying at this resort, and we had a good time. It was you know first time being in warm water that was on the ocean, clean water. I'm assuming Cancun's cleaner than um, Santa Monica because that's where I did the majority of my swimming growing up. And it was cold and filthy, um, but I'm okay. I didn't grow an extra arm yet. We went to the marketplace and all the Mexican dudes down there were like, MC Hammer, you MC Hammer, MC Hammer, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. MC Hammer, MC Hammer. And me and Scarab went on a mission to buy weed in a foreign country, probably very, very stupid. And this man pulled out a stick, like a, it looked like a staff or a wrapped in newspaper and just broke it in half. I remember, like, you know, I was selling weed back then. I was like, damn, he gave us probably a, a, a quarter ounce, maybe a, a half ounce. I don't know. It was a lot of weed for $10, the U.S. equivalent of $10. I mean, the Mexican equivalent of 10 U.S. dollars. We went on the beach and, you know, this scares a real chill. He scares another dude, like Takuma, I'm sorry, himself being like very mature and just chill. So he's like, I'm going on this side. We're on a beach in the middle of the night. I'm on this side and we just smoked our own weed and just chill. We didn't get rowdy. We didn't nothing. We didn't talk. We didn't freestyle. I just sat on this the best high I've ever had. I haven't smoked weed since I was 18, but back then I was still 17. It's just whew, great, real chocolate tie, whatever you want to call it. Great, great, great weed. Not that I recommend you going to a marketplace or the plaza or placita in, in Mexico and, and going to purchase um, some mota, marijuana. However, it worked out great for us. Then the next night we went to a, a bar and I don't know how it came up. Oh, I think I, it was. I was sitting in this bar in Cancun and our waiter, somebody in there had a drifter's tattoo, which is the... Um, Latino gang in, 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 it used to be in my neighborhood. And I was like, yo, I was like, hey, fool, you from Drifters? He's like, yeah, what's up? And I was like, I'm from Mid City. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, blah, blah, Pico, Cochran, my grandparents, Olympic La Brea. I lived on, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, what? He's like, my, my, my mom taught at this school over there and blah, blah, blah. And we own this place. I was like, holy shit. Like, wow. Like, people from my neighborhood doing big things. Like, that was one of my first instances of me. Just like, wow, people, somebody from my community on some gangster shit is doing some real gangster shit. Like, holy shit. Later living on Tucson, I, I, I would meet like dudes that I knew from my neighborhood that would be in a bar in Tucson. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing out here? Because they go through, used to go through Tucson and pick up weed or dope, you know? So take it to, you know, different other cities in the South. So people I had come across with and gang culture in LA and just, just, you know, it was weird. The more I traveled, the more that wasn't the only experience I would have like that. But I felt proud of my of my neighborhood. And I always, like I said, these street organizations always like to 
celebrate the bigger things and positive things they were doing. And then I think there we got invited to my first phone party, which was so weird. And this is 95. I graduated in 95. So the Macarena before it hit up, uh, America was big down there, which is the Macarena by Los Del Rio, uh, which was on a quiz for me to work at Rasputin's in Berkeley. And I got that question right because of the time, this trip in Mexico where I learned the Macarena. And we went to a phone party which being a kid from the hood, I can't, well, some of these things I can't describe to you unless you're really from, from the hood. Like, I'm like, I didn't get it. And the guy was explaining it to me and I didn't get it. And so we get it there. I think we kind of dressed him in person. I'd never even been in a nightclub before or a bar. So I went to my first bar, first nightclub, me and Scarab. And, and then we go to a phone party and I'm like, this is like the sink when you wash dishes the wrong way. Like, what are these, you know, what are these white people doing? What's going on? People dressed in like togas, made out of sheets from their hotel room. Girls, I'm like, what? It's amazing. It's just like, well, you came here to get dirt. Like, there's never, maybe now, but in, in that era, never in a black club. You want to get somebody's Jordans fucked up or their fucking suede polo or Timberland? What? A black woman's hair at a phone party? Are you fucking joking me? It was so weird and amazing and phenomenal. But that was the duality of of being me and being in the netherworlds. Like, you know, Anacron is, is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a breakdancing crypt that tours with the jazz fusion band with one of the guys from Ohio Players that plays the flugelhorn on that song. It's a strange, strange world. You know what I mean? So Son of a Guns is the is the girl song on this on this or one of the girl songs on this album or woman songs. Uh I think we were all girls and boys back then. I step into the club with the same fit. I've been rocking all day, laughing at the whole line about being on the list and watching them all pay. My homie tried to holler, but she didn't stop for him. He didn't know we were performing, and he could have got a man hit the bar before the show. I'm trying to get scummy, show black honey. We just some lovable, huggable, fuckable son of a gun. It was, that was a great chorus. I don't know who came up with that, um, but it was great. Justin Toon produced it. Pretty uh, uh, known drum and bass DJ. Thanks, Anna Cron, for letting me know that. We just some lovable, huggable, fuckable son of a guns. Looking for some lovable, huggable, fuckable ones. We just some lovable, huggable, fuckable son of a guns. Looking for some lovable, huggable, fuckable ones. We just some lovable, huggable, fuckable son of a guns. My shit, my verse is full of fucking Spanish. Me, I'm a really try hard when it comes to Chicano culture, so I hope I've been forgiven. Uh, I have a song called Mi Corazón. Mexican and Salvi, the perfect girl from Cali. Met her at a party in Van Nuys in the valley. She said her name was Letty, that's short for Leticia. I said my name is Nick, quite a pleasure to be meeting you. Perhaps if you had the time, I wouldn't mind treating you to dinner in a movie. Cause I really want to be with you. She giggled just a little, put a number in my phone. I text a little later to make sure she made it home. Made it home, made it home. Mi corazón te pertenece. I don't care what your friends say. When I did Mikora, I was just Mikora song, Mikora song. I was doing Psycho de Mayo. <laughs> and uh, it's a different kind of uh, Latino crowd than you might. Like a Merch show is in LA, it's a lot of Latinos. But Psycho de Mayo is a different kind of energy. So I thought, fuck, I'm, I'm going to definitely do Mikora song here. It's about to go up. Bro, I did it and it was like crickets. I said, dang, okay. I was like, yo, so I guess uh, me speaking Spanish ain't cool with y'all. Kind of like when y'all say nigga, is it the same thing? And then uh, the homegrown and Crip just busted up. Brown is made in calor. El poder que nos une es puro Dios y amor. Soy humo y te lo juro, el rumbo suyo mejor que el otro. Ser celoso es tonto, no hay valor, no hay dolor, no hay nada menos honor. Pero I know that, like, D Smoke does the bilingual thing better than me, but I always felt like, I believe we touched on this podcast, but my neighbor once told me, you know, I'm not. On my street, a lot of flags are like American flags, and he flies the California flag or the UCLA or USC flag. They're they're very LA, him and his wife. But he's like, I'm Californian. 
And uh, that's kind of what I feel like. Like, I'm Californian, and Chicano culture is so part of, you know, El Salvadorian um, and, and Mexican culture specifically and especially. I know some Guatemalans, Ecuadorians, and Colombians live here and lots of different types of Latinos, but the predominant influence is on the overall culture, I believe, Ch our Chicano culture. So I, I, you know, I always wanted to represent that for better or worse. So forgive me for those who feel like I'm trying too hard, like the crowd of Psycho de Mayo, and uh, I understand. But uh, I just wanted, especially because then it was really, this early 2000s, no one was repping that shit except for like OMD, who did a great job. It was just very few boom bap or real hip hop people representing that part of um, LA. And and I was living in Arizona, I guess at the time. I rapped about Circus, which was this tennis shoe. I was getting free shoes from Circa, shout out to them. I wore mismatch, mismatch ones. I had so many pairs. I would get the same one in multiple colors and wear. That was weird flex, bro. But I would wear different colors of the same model of shoe. And uh, like uh, looking for Fiat May Haina with some nice kakayaks. My uh, homeboy, Saul uh, from Highland Park. And I, I talk about that often in my rap. But Highland Park was not a place black people could go back then. But we both moved to Tucson and we had, we were friends, became friends there. And he would put, we would listen to art. He was the only other dude from LA that was living in Tucson. So he was a street dude. He was in and out of jail at the time. He's done so well for himself and, and been a, a great father and a contributed member of society. But at the time, we were delinquents, him more so than I, I think. But he taught me words like Ramfala and Kakayax and all this like slang, jail. L.A. gang slang, Latino, Chicano slang. He's, his mother's from Obregón. I think he's born in Obregón in Mexico. He took me to Obregón. Like, I was having, you know, uh, a lot of influence from So our crew graffiti rock was a lot of Mexican-American dudes. And uh, me and my homeboy Roland were the only black dudes. Probably the only two. Not the only two. Two of very, two, two of very few black people in Tucson. So I was surrounded. So that's why it's coming out, especially on this verse. And I say graffiti rock. And I, I shout out Art LeBeau or playing 18 with the bullet. Just getting that documented was important to me. And not in a way that I, I consciously did just for that purpose. Like it was, you know, how I was talking and the... Uh, Slang and certain slang, I, I I was probably pronouncing it wrong, saying it wrong, but a uh, Haina, Fiderme, Kakeox, there's a bunch of them in there. I don't even know who says Kakeox. I like he could have been telling me shit that didn't make sense, and I would have been like, yeah, because he was so cool to me. He was so hood, bro. Like I didn't drive. He taught me how to drive. I believe in a stolen car in Tucson. But we would go to the Tucson Mall. That was the big thing, <laughs> and try to get girls' numbers. Oh shit. And I came and we were LA dudes, so I had a white t-shirt, jeans, some nice white tennis shoes, or my my skate shoes. And I came down and my white t-shirt was wrinkled. I just took it out of the package. And it only he would only wear Stafford white tees from JC Penny, bro. That was expensive for a white t-shirt. Not fruit of the loom, not flimsy shit. So he I think he made me buy Stafford's. And then he made me go back upstairs. He came upstairs with me, like parked the car, came upstairs, and like made me iron my white t-shirt and he said, oh, you always have to increase the crease, fool. And like crease the crease, taught me how to crease the uh, sleeves and like the little middle crease and the thing. So it kind of puffs out on it around the chest. And then we could go to the mall. He was not going to go to the mall with me in just a random looking white tee. It had to be ironed every time we go out. So shout out to him and shout out to Graffiti Rock, my crew in Tucson. A lot of, most of them were ex-writers and um, DJs. Roland was a rapper and a writer. Just still, even with, with Anacron, like I was usually not down with people who didn't have an obsession or a familiarity with one or more of the elements of hip hop. Yeah, we'll move on. That beat was done by Justin Toon. I got that done. I got that right. Uh, I don't know who has the best verse on the song, but you should probably go listen to it and let me know. And if you're listening to this, I'm not going to do it at the end, but uh, rate or subscribe, rate the podcast. Spotify, some more people. I don't make any money from this shit, so people can hear it. And I, I, we skipped a lot of the the early on episodes, but I was doing this so that I could get ready for my last album, kind of listening to all my old shit so that I could get the last album right finally and nail it. And also, it's a good roll up lead out to that lead up to that album. And for my kids, man, it, um, my dad wasn't around. I don't know. Uh, fuck all about my dad. I could feel, you know, I couldn't feel a page with what I know about my father for the most part. Uh, and that fucks with me. And even the men I do know, like I'm still learning shit about my grandfather and he's 95. And I go and spend time with him and I ask him a fuck ton of questions. 
And God, thank God he can still recall a lot of it. But, you know, like he's telling me stories that his younger brother stabbed his other younger brother in a knife with a chest over who is now his wife. But they were just dating at the time. But that's how serious he was. Stabbed his brother in the heart. And then they had to drive to the nearest city 30 minutes because no one would operate on a black person. And then he got in a car with my grandmother and started trying to drive to Florida because he got the call. And he had to stop at Palm Springs. They stayed the night and they woke up and he started driving west on, I guess, the 10 or whatever, driving west. And I don't even think the 10 existed. And my grandmother, because she was a little more familiar with travel. She was moved from Chicago to LA. She was she was like, you're going back home. When she, I think maybe she was sleeping in the car. She was like, where are you going, bro? Is this east? Is this the way? My grandfather was a country boy. He didn't know north, south, east, or west. He knew how to get home and get to work, uh, get to church. So these podcasts, um, if they find them boring or or self-indulgent, it, it's nothing like that. It was research. It started on Patreon. If you're joining Patreon now, you can join. I'm not really posting anything new there. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with that space. I kind of want to close it down, but I just haven't had the time. But if you join it, there's old episodes. There's a shit ton of songs and exclusives that are up there if you want to. But this was just for Patreon at first. And then people liked it. And I thought, why not give it to everybody? Uh, if we get a little bit ahead, I'll start releasing episodes early there. And now we're moving on. All right. So uh, Balls to the Wall is uh, the obligatory indie rap anthem. Probably my best rap so far as I can see on the album. Independence, shit. Y'all don't know what that means, man. I've been serving slanging tape since I was only 15. On my label, on my masters in the street. Fuck them bastards. You were MC, be a rapper, destiny. I'm the master. You were slave, getting them home and just to pay the rent. Run like you on your own with rockets on that 12 inch. Or maybe even MCA subsidiaries don't get paid. I mean, no cheese with all them logos on your album. And we sample big timers. That's baby. Before the world, before. The world became fascinated with Birdman. 98, that was a sample of a song called Top of the World from How You Love That, Volume 2. I know you wish a cup liner, nigga with a dick like an anaconda. Neighborhood hot boy, super shiner. Don't play a president, big timer, timer. Before the world was cash money crazy. This is the time, like, we were those guys, like, listening to big timers and listening to, like, indie gangster rap or indie trap rap or before it was even trap. Just, we weren't listening to Black Star. And as you could tell from my verse, like, I'm throwing shots. Like, I don't fuck with conscious rap. Also, because I was meeting a lot of these cats and I was like, yo, like, oh, shit, that's a whole ass white girl, but I thought you hated crackers. Okay. Oh, you're really trying to buy cocaine? With your vegan ass. Like, shit like that. I was just like, yo, bro, just just do you. Like, I would much rather you rap about both. You could, This is us just doing both. And it hasn't been beneficial to my career, but I have my integrity. I don't have to worry about living up to an image. I have friends that are managers, and they compare certain artists like, yeah, homeboy is just who he is. Like, if he goes out on... T- I was like, oh, somebody just... One of his artists had just tweeted something. I was like, ouch, that has that's going to be horrible. He's like, honestly, it's no big deal because people know when they get into business with this artist, they know who they're getting. Now, this guy over here, you'll never see him do interviews. He doesn't tweet. He only gets on social media every when he has a new project out because he has an image to protect. And I would much rather deal with the fallout from being myself or people not listening to my music because I won't stay in the, lim- uh, in, in the lane. But America's America. People want their ketchup to be ketchup. Heinz, when we, if you're a kid my age or person my age, Heinz made green ketchup, at, purple ketchup at one point. Nobody bought it because ketchup is rare. It's made by Heinz. You will reach over the Heinz mustard to grab the French's mustard because Heinz makes ketchup, French's makes mustard. You don't want Heinz mustard. Some people. We're very brand oriented. With capitalism, too far gone. Same thing with our music. Okay. Like, I think I have really good socially aware black pro black songs but that crowd doesn't listen to my music because i don't do that my label is this and they'll come to me for this i think some people will feel like in our scene that black rappers are only gangster rappers if i want intelligent emo hip-hop i'll listen to a white rapper and when i want 
to listen to a black rapper, I'll listen to Dipset and blah, blah, blah. But so it's, it's just weird to me um, who, how people pick and choose. It's, I mean, it's not weird. It's, I understand it. But that was me in this verse. Like, I'm calling out those kind of rappers. Like, I also don't like people who do pro-black or anti-white. It's okay to do pro-black, but anti-white music for white people on labels owned by white people. I don't get that. There's just, you know, that's almost as bad as like people who pretend to be gangsters. Like there are certain ways to do things. And to me, that's not one of them. But maybe it's it's all in the point again. I disagree, but it's, you know, my I don't know shit. I was I had a conversation with a a very a, a pan-African nationalist activist rapper. He went turned around and said that oh Mercer's politics are all fucked up, you know. And we we argued all night, but I just I disagree. I think revolution um looks different. And it may not be based on race if it's going to succeed in the true outcome, which hopefully is world peace, right? Anyway, that got deep for a second. Woo. The next track is two. And two, now I see that one is the intro. And then we broke the song up into three parts. And uh, my verse is horrible. Anacron's rapping his ass off. He shouts out Kobe Ty. Ah, the vivid ladies. Imagine that. Kobe Ty. Yikes. I need to see. We need a documentary on like the vivid... Uh, I forgot the one that I liked. Oh my God. I'm glad I forgot. But uh, it's definitely into a really heavy in an adult film. I think we all were. When, before you whippersnappers could get all your pornography for free online, you had to buy DVDs. So if you had a favorite porn star, it was definitely because DVDs could be anywhere from $40 to $60, I believe. Imagine that. And yeah, so you kind of picked, you definitely had a favorite if you're going to shell out the money. But Kobe Ty was one of one of the more popular uh, adult film actresses at that point. Uh, so that kind of dates this, not in a bad way, just like it lets you know when this was popping. Okay, before we get into California Soul, I would like to go back to the the two interlude this shit is sick nasty Ella, ugly, 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 ugly. i'm only the bony brother the bully box up your homies you know me i want to fuck kobe she's so fly if we meet i hope she like black guys that got hot creole blood in they veins and a strain of dna to play a role. i do have one part on verse that's okay so a mic strung upside down for a left-handed genius that's the only thing on um, reference to Jimi hendrix which i didn't learn that fun fact until i saw a great film by andrew dice clay i'm sure he would be canceled and, and maybe rightfully so but i this is as a child of the 80s this is what i grew up thinking was funny mary mary quite contrary trim that pussy it's so damn hairy <laughs> Because it was forbidden, and Andrew Dice Clay was, especially for a white comedian, because I wasn't familiar with Sam Kennison or some other people of the time, George Carlin, probably a little over my head in the young age, but, you know, boobies, tits, and he, you know, always with uh, why LL Cool J was fun to me because he referenced Oreo cookies, why, you know, uh, I think uh, Run DMC referenced uh, Mother Goose. I got Susan, Mother Goose, both did their thing, but Jan Max getting loose. Andrew Dice Clay referenced Mother Goose. Ah, Mother Goose, I fucked her. Oh. Yeah, good old Mother Goose. Remember her? I fucked her. Probably one of the reasons I grew up smoking cigarettes, I thought he was so cool. He had fucking Tone Lope in the movie Ford Fairlane. I feel like it's Morris Day in the time in that as well. Or is that just a Kevin Smith thing? Man, he uh, talks about the guitar, Jimmy Hendrix guitar. A Fender Stratocaster strung upside down for a left-handed jeans. And fucking uh, Ed O'Neill is in it. Uh, Al Bundy. Foo, boy. He had booty time. Booty time. Booty time. Across the USA. It's like when you had an R-rated movie that you watched on VHS when your parents wasn't home, that was my brother and I's go-to movie for Fairlane. To his clients, he's the greatest. What is it they call you? Mr. Rock and Roll Detective? To everyone else... He's just a dick. I'm sorry that I made you clean the toilets and the bathtubs. I mean, who did all the work in bed? Andrew. Ow! Dice. Clay. Oh! Probably should go back and try to watch it. DJ Hydra's gonna kill me, but like, certain, like, Point Brank, Point Brank didn't stand the test of time for me. Sorry, I, that was another movie I was obsessed with around that time. I remember 
being on a date with a girl and going to Amoeba and buying the DVD. And I was like, I'm gonna we're gonna order this food and we're gonna come home. We're gonna watch Point Break. It's gonna be a she was a younger girl and didn't hadn't seen it, you know, by a couple missed it by a couple years. And man, I put that shit on and 10 minutes into it, I had to apologize. I was like, fuck. This is god awful. This is not vintage Keanu. This is Keanu. It's kind of like how I feel about Reasonable Doubt. My, by the way, I met a dude from Queens recently who agreed with my hot take on uh, Reasonable Doubt, but that's neither here nor there. But like, is Jay Z before he became Jay Z? It's still Jay Z, but it's like it's still Keanu. But man, it's not John Wick. Johnny Utah is no John Wick. I think he was named Johnny Utah. That Johnny Utah is no John Wick. And I'm going to say that Keanu played another John to do his John role better. You know, Bill and Ted's, he fit perfectly. And, you know, I had every, like, uh, all, I had all the Keanu movies on DVD, but that one um, did did not hold up. I, and I may go as far to say, I think I like, I only seen 10 minutes of the remake, but that 10 minutes I liked better than the 10 minutes I watched of Point Break in the recent memory. Moving on. Cali sold out is a just a song about California talking about it from from an aspect that over a type of beat that a lot of people weren't talking about California on. And that's me with a smile, fist clinch when I stroll every day. Top down, don't know nothing about the cold, never been snowed in, cold stays, golden, bright lights, big city bus, cost a buck sixty, but look out for the sixties when they out rolling, tearing up every function, and I swear it be for nothing. LA niggas going out. And specific, you know, getting into specific gangs being named and streets and places and uh, himself uh, versus very shout outs like on old school LA like King T's Lokes. And no knock, like it's funny when I found out King T wasn't even was from Texas originally, or Snoop was born in Mississippi. Like all that stuff is crazy, but they're so LA. Um, but you can't escape the Southern roots. And uh, oh yeah, I didn't mention that for Ball to the Fall, we even uh, scratch Youngster, and I was obsessed with Youngster. So my, I didn't know Youngster was on uh, Wanna Be a Ball Up because I didn't like it because it was too commercial. But that TYP throw Young Players front to back those albums that was all I was playing like when everybody was listening to Black Star and Erica Badu The Roots like I could give a fuck no disrespect that wasn't my shit that was my shit though Young Player Youngster is one of the or Young Star if you have to spell it if you're gonna look for it um, knocking pictures off the wall that whole I got a whole album front to back Riding, blowing beans, sipping on a daily basis. Quick to hop out on your block and rig faces. Slam, slam, no open space. Looking good and standing tall. Be down your block, knocking pictures off your wall. Now I come around your block, turning heads and riding slow. With a pocket full of money, but I got to get more standing. So being able to, I didn't, I knew it was Youngster's voice, but I didn't even know what song it was from till later. But that's the type of shit where he was, people scratching. Houston rappers wasn't happening on a hip hop tape made in Chicago by three dudes from LA. Like we were all over the place, and no wonder this wasn't a rousing success because it probably could, it can't be put into a lane. And uh, Cali sold out is another you would never hear rappers that was traditionally West Coast that we're going to talk about like name dropping gangs and talking crip shit and all this other stuff. Either dial to seven digits, call up Bridget, her man's a, it's you know that was kind of hood like for Oakland. And I guess this is kind of our version, but it was a little more specific because L.A. is just different. You know what I'm saying? But rarely would you have, you know, this this kind of, I think it's what, California Soul, Mamas and Papas, Papa, some very not funky uh, sample to talk about L.A. Uh, but I think we did a good job. Um, my verse is decent. I just probably should have spaced it out, took some words out. I'm rushing a little bit. Things I will learn later or just do it on... The worst thing you could do back then was not do one take. And I, because the punches were kind of also abrupt. We did this on reel to reel also. And Akron wanted to let us let you know that. So that's another reason everything is one take for me because it's hard to punch on reel to reel. You uh, just got to do another take. So this is a very uh, analog-y. I got to listen to it on. We might have to repress this on vinyl. We also want to shout out The Basement because uh, Galapagos put this out when they couldn't put it out anymore. Rock at The Basement. Rock and Ori. Ori, who uh, does Moose shirts, I think, now. And Rock of The Basement, legendary um, fixture in the hip-hop community, is now a public defender in Oakland, California, saving the lives of young ghetto children. Literally, inner-city children. 
keeping them out of prison and trying to get them fair sentences as, as home and on the right track as soon as possible with really, really a lot of respect for Mr. Robert Morass. But yeah, they put out this album, but I would like to see this come back on wax um, if it was really done on Real to Real. And knowing Anacron, he probably has access to the masters. Real to Real is like those big tapes you guys see in old school rock movies. Those are like hip hop. Doesn't have a lot of history with those because it's a newer music, but any record done before, I don't even know. I would say any major label record done before 2000 is definitely on Real to Real. Maybe ADAT started coming in, some of them, but that's still tape. ADATs were huge VHS tapes that you could record to. There was DA88, DA88s, which are like hi 8 tapes, but they're still tapes. But you have to ask a real engineering nerd for when the full switch was on a major label. Like we started the digital music. The indie rappers started putting shit out digitally because that was just like they frowned on Ninth Wonder and even uh, Anacron, like for making beats on with Microsoft. Are you kidding me? You're not using an MP or you're not using an SP. Same thing was for recording your shit. You weren't recording a reel to reel. No, we couldn't afford studio time. So we would record on computers or the rolling eight hard disk things. And we we were the beginning of phasing out tapes. In my mind, someone could come differently. But, you know, there was no rapper I knew of at the time excited to pioneer Pro Tools at that time. We were excited because we didn't have to pay some um, usually white dude or older black dude that hated rap to record our vocals or to punch us in. Um, that's when punching became easier. But that's Cali Soul, my verse is good. I think it's well written. It's rushed. Um, the delivery could have been better. And if I was doing it now, I'll probably have punched it or recorded it, listened to it, came back and recorded it another day once I had command of the of the of the verse. And that's why I tell rappers now. So if you're an aspiring rapper, like your verses should be like dribbling. You know what I mean? It'd be great if you dribbled the verse a while before you got into the booth with the verse. So you could put the verse behind your back, over your shoulder, all that stuff. And if you can't get it in one take, record it separate. No one knows anymore. Doing shit in one take was good because it saved. It was a, a, a star on your chest. It was cool to be able to knock it out in one take. But also, the quality, if you keep going over tape, the quality gets um, diminished when you keep doing multiple takes on tape. And also, it takes up more time. So... That's why one takes were celebrated. You know, I always imagine being in a band and somebody fucking up and you having to play the whole song over or the vocalist fucking up and you have, you know, usually you don't do vocals in the same room as you do your instrumentation. But early on, you know, but there's something to be said for one take. A lot of Marshall presidents one take, but I was a better rapper because of sessions like this where I had to nail shit in one take and all the Living Legend stuff on four track. My one takes on 316 are a lot better. Because I would listen to shit like this and cringe and be like, man, it just, it's, it's, it's motivational. So there's pros and cons. But for the, um, I've met a couple um, aspiring, I don't say aspiring, rappers on the come up that listen to this. And that's, that's, that's your personal bar. If you're not into rapping, you probably don't give a fuck. Next up are the solo songs where these motherfuckers rap circles around me. Woo! Let me tell you, Love Ballad, this is a dope song. I love it when I do a show and there's a black crowd. I love when fools act out and start to rap loud in a wax style. Yeah. My rhymes are so fresh, you can hear the pages flipping in the background. I don't give a fuck. I'm that proud. A right. Mac found nose up with his head in the back cloud. That's how I love it. I ain't coming back down. Ha. On the ground, I walk around loving the natural high. I love it when people point and say that's a cool guy. I love watching McCall of Apple's album. How Do You Like It by himself is arguably the best song on this album. Jeez, man, he's such, his style is so unique. Um, he doesn't sound like anybody to I me. Mean, he never sounded like, when I remember, I remember hearing him rap the first time and being in awe. I remember seeing his dreads, just like, he was just like, this is like a cool, handsome fucking dude that could rap his ass off. What the fuck, man? Where does he get this? Like, everything he did, he was just cool, but not in a traditional way, cool, like, earthy, afro like, pan-African Fonzie. That's what it was like. I was like, whoa, this cool. Everything's like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like eyes half closed, dreadlocks kind of in his face. And just, yeah, man. You know, earth tones matching, 
you know, nice like hiking boot on or something. Just like I could see him, like man, like he was like, whoa. When you go to school with a bunch of people with S curls and fades and all dressed the same in Dockers and Negro League jackets and button up plaid shirts, and this dude comes together, you know, I'm just trying to slap a t shirt on with something that represents who I am to stand out. And he's just like subdued, definitely very wizard like. Anyway, yeah, that was a uh, uh, definitely like him, like the other homeboy Malik that was in uh, in Log Cabin. Like those dreads are the dreads that I have now. I always wanted to have like the free form, thick locks. Like that was my fashion or hair inspiration. Not many people, uh, I guess, talk about that. But uh, yeah, I just want I don't know weird facts of why I have. Like I saw, I thought that was like the coolest shit ever. So when I finally grew the locks that I probably have for the rest of my life, I, I knew that I wanted them to look like like they're like hood Bob Marley shit. Like I didn't want to pretend to be Jamaican or pretend to be an ultra Rasta. I just wanted that look that I saw. Like I was, I just, you know, when you see something, you're like, that's it. And it wasn't in a magazine, and it's still, you know, now it kind of is, but it wasn't in the '90s. It wasn't cool, and there are very few people, even rappers or reggae singers, that look like that. I was like, man. This is this is a look. I, I, that's the word I'm looking for. Fashion icon. Now I can move on. I've been looking for that word this whole time. Yeah, a love ballad by Anacron. He played the keys and the trumpet on that. Like I'm on uh, K Jazz 88.1. If you live in LA, you know, playing on the key. Yeah, it's Brian Allen on the keys and the trumpet. And live bass is played by Griffin Rodriguez, who also was an engineer on this record. Yeah, this really feels like K Jazz. KKJZ FM and HD1 Long Beach. This is KJAZ 88.1, a service of California State University, Long Beach. And PNS did the beat. PNS of the legendary hip hop pioneering group, The Mole Men Out of the Shy. The Mole Men, the Mole Men, the Mole Men, the Mole Men, the Mole Men. The mole men. The mole men. And um, next up, it's like the darkest day right before the night. Uh, this is Come Back Home. While this song is the reason probably felt exist. That's why, you know, even good things come out of shit. It's probably the worst song. And I've never listened to it. Even when the CD came out, I didn't listen to it. I knew it was horrible then. So... I am about to do something I haven't done in over two decades. I remember 10th grade when I first started to Jones. The first Adams family before you were well known. I was down from the start. We were around the same age. Adams family values was the very next stage. Gold diggers now and then. Before the magazines, before the late 90s when you started wild with men. After Caspar was hooked with the ice storm and Pekka, it was my heart that you took. The opposite of sex put me over the top. Puffalo 66, girl, you really need to stop. Sometimes... Things are worse than you remember. Sometimes they're better than you remember. That was exactly as horrible as I remember it. Um, it was a challenging beat. Um, we were recording at Justice's house. I don't think he had a song or an album, so it's probably me trying to be inclusive. Not that the beat is whack, but it's probably it was a little bit too advanced for me trying to do one take. Singing's horrible. Uh, Pocket is horrible. Lyrics are horrible. It's just a horrible, probably the worst song I've ever done. Um, how can I reach to justify it? I don't know if he's talked about his influence enough in rap. Um, parody rap, it's kind of like, this is all tongue-in-cheek, obviously. But it's, it's no excuse not to have the raps done well. Um, but I think, like, I was nervous saying it. Like, there are people in the studio, I don't like rapping in front of people. Um, so I'm sure there are people in the studio I didn't want to do more takes because I didn't want to say these things again because I didn't know if anyone else got it. So I was embarrassed. I rushed through it. But like I said, it, out of this came felt. 
But the influence of parodies and rap, like and like the first video I ever saw, I didn't know MTV existed until someone told me how to turn it on in the fourth, third, fourth grade and to watch the Eat It video. That's the first video, music video I saw in my life was Eat It by Weird Al Yankovic. And then at the time, Russ Parr, I believe, um, was on K-Day and he had a group called Bobby Jimmy and the Critters. And Bobby Jimmy and the Critters would remake a current rap song, the most probably popular for me was hair or weave hair weave hair weave is it your hair weave oh girl I don't know is it your hair Roaches. That was a parody of uh, Rumors by Timex Social Club, I believe. Look at all these roaches. How these roaches get started? Thought about dirty people and they was nasty, sleazy, slimy. They house they never clean it. Roaches have big families. Your house they think they own. I tried to kill one on the couch using my telephone. Roach had a rap. Well, I'll be something, another something. Swimming in the pool. Like, so the sense of humor, uh, Fat Boys were a huge influence on me. Disorderlies, Crushing, that album was the first rap tape I bought. The sound that you hear is going to be so there, but have no fear. The Fat Boys are here. Me, the Chief Rocket, who rocks Steve. The Fat Boys are here. The Fat Boys are here. The Chief Rocket, who rocks Steve. And to my side, with the rap, the Chris Marketing. And our DJ. So parody rap was a huge. As, just as much as gangster rap. There was just as much parody rap as it was gangster rap in the mid to late 80s because shit was new. Um, and I had equal equal parts. So definitely into parody rap kind of fell off as gangster rap. Came, both of them, as far as I know, as I heard it, were, had their seats in the West because Russ Parr was a host on K-Day, which was the first hip-hop station. It was on the West, though. It was L.A. based, and so was gangster rap. And he was still playing... Or was it Greg Mack? One or the other. I could be West Park, Greg Mack. But they were playing gangster rap and parody rap on the same station. And the Fat Boys. And But as rap got older and gangster rap got more popular, it kind of fell off. But I think the West Coast is also a hub for a lot of good comedy clubs. I wish the comedic element, the lighthearted comedic element, would have stayed a part of rap. Because I think that also keeps people from making corny shit like... It sets the extreme, and if you make something... Like, when he did Gangster's Paradise, you know, like, it, it just... There should have been more of that, like... Uh, but from coming from within the culture, so it'd be more well-received and, and done a little better. However, I digress. Song is horrible. Don't listen to it. I list chronologically all of Christina Ricci's movies. These are things that are hard to do pre-Wikipedia, people. This is... It comes from a place of true fandom and or obsession. And Christina Ricci wasn't at the, you know, wasn't Christina Ricci. Like, I knew these things because I had all of these DVDs. I had seen all of these films. And, yeah, I really thought that it was a possibility to uh, meet and wed this young woman, who I knew nothing about. I mean, from the interviews, but, you know, lustful, young, misguided, moving on. Best song on the album, maybe best underground rap song of that decade. Uh... I love it. How do you like it by himself? I love the sample. It's five minutes almost, and I wish the beat came back at the end again with the hook. It is a classic for me. Huh? I like my cars fast, women hot, and jewelry big. I like my clothes just as loud as my music is. I like to say fuck it. I like my friends thuggish. I like my beats bumping. I like my women rugged. The type of woman to say fuck you. The type of girl don't trust a motherfucker but you. Half the time she don't even trust you. So many highlights. It's definitely it's another girl song, but uh, I think it's classy. But you know who am I to say somebody's classy is someone object someone's objectification in rap? Yeah, that's a whole nother issue. Well, guess we talk songs that I've made about women that some women have told me are objectifying them, and then some women tell me that are empowering and they love. And then if it's not about her, my wife hates all the songs. So there's that. Um. <laughs> Asked me to push her hood back, and I understood that. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of rappers rapping about it. I believe that's a clitor clitoris reference, and that was very important. I you know, I learned by being like the ugly, non-cool kid from having homegirls tell me about the proper way to go down on a woman. 
I don't know if I have it right yet, but that, you know, neither here nor there. I just thought that that was a dope uh, thing. Talked about. I just like to point out things that we were talking about in rap that really weren't talking about. She asked me to push the hood back, and I understood that. And maybe we were talking about it amongst men. And when men, black men, especially with dreads, celebrating going down on women is not a normal occurrence. Definitely in the late '90s, and probably not now. A lot of rosters are very anti going down on their partner. A lot of rosters I've met. I'll speak from my experience. But yeah, so I thought that was probably my favorite line from my favorite song on the album. Lessons learned. Great sample. I feel like someone else used it. Good sentiment. My raps weren't delivered well. The first verse is just about uh, what I've learned from watching my mother um, overcome abusive relationships through the years and still wanting to try love again. And now she's been happily married for a couple decades, but... She had every right to give up on men, and specifically black men. Um, So I think that helped a lot with my self-esteem and um, definitely helped me in my first divorce. I attain life lessons, mixed messages daily When I think I understand it, contradictions drive me crazy I see my mother suffer abuse from multiple men I seen the same woman get right back up with the courage to love a man again from my observations, I can see I know nothing except that I'm a dying before that comes from suffering. But once you accept death, it helps to ease the suffering. I've learned to love and I've learned Proud of myself for being able to articulate that at that age. But yeah, still, as you can listen to other songs, had a lot of growing to do. Um, but I, I end the verse saying I know nothing and need to learn. Uh, uh, second verse is about asking your friends for help and saying that in a room full of black men and saying, you know, like, being able to ask your friends for help is 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 a strength, not a weakness. It's definitely not a narrative going on in hip hop. Uh, so that was dope. And all of them, and Anacrine himself are also covering things. Um, you know, Anacrine aligns something. Someone was watching something, some reel today. But I love to learn that girls love to fuck just as much as guys. Uh, just breaking down, you know, things. That was dope. Lessons learned. And uh, himself had another bar that stuck with me for the rest of my life. Like, Something, something. No matter what you're going through, no matter what I'm going through, I got too many problems to be worrying about them too. You know, like take action or let it work itself out, but don't worry about your problems. He was definitely a very wise, wise young individual, man. Wise and intelligent. No, uh, no, no pun intended. So that was probably my favorite part of that song. And then there's an opera singer, Glinda the Good Witch, I believe. I could be off. But I believe, yeah, a Chicago-based opera singer, Glenda, Gwendolyn the Good Witch, did the vocals on the end. And they sound great. And I don't know who else was putting opera vocal, live opera vocals over break beats. So um, if you want to listen to the end of that song just for that, it's a treat. It's dope. Last three songs. The Green Days was amazing. Do you have the time to listen to me one uh, uh, about nothing and everything all at once? That was based on me and Anacron being the only black dudes I knew that were listening to Green Day when Dookie dropped. Thank you, MTV. I think we were ditching school one day. We caught the video and then we became, I don't know how we became Green Day fans, but this, I bought the tape. I loved it so much. And then we actually went to the Green Day concert. I often forget that that was my first introduction to live music by white people and just music like white music in general, like my first punk rock experience. And then didn't dwindle off until I went on Warp Tour. But uh, Vanilla Ice and Green Day. I always credit Vanilla Ice, but I never give Green Day enough credit. <laughs> The irony or the, the the synchronicity is that they're from the Bay and they were in the indie scene and I ended up being in the indie scene in the Bay later. They were definitely pioneering the path that I was on, along with Too Short, E-40. I don't think Green Day, I think Rancid, I don't think they get united enough, but that was the energy that was in the Bay Area, regardless of race or regardless of genre. The DIY ethic was there and it benefited me heaps and loads, Mike. So that's us. If you ever want to hear fun, that's probably one of the best skits I've ever done because it's pure, like... The, my youth and passion, and it was horrible, but it was great. The next one is Pals, like the almost most gangster song on the album, smacked together with the least gangster, quote-unquote, song on the album. 
sampling uh, Corrupt Down with a nigga damn near before a nigga was rhyming. My closest homeboys. What's up, Ham? What's up, Mark? What's up, Jess? What's up, Cop? Eastside, Crystal, Jedi, Perf, Pro, and Pops. Do you got some real niggas? Well, that oh, all that's depends that's on the definition that you used to classify friends. I'm picky with who's selected into my exclusive and elite circle of friends. Every fool I meet ain't gonna be the homie. But a gang of Marks claim to know me. Only on that shit when they need a name to drop. That was, like, exactly us. Like, almost before I started rapping, my first, like, my longest running friendship was with these guys. And I'm talking about, yeah, back we talk about Varsity Blues, like, people I was hanging with that in a rap scene that didn't have my back. People in my crew that would fuck with people in crews. And I don't know how I feel about that day. Taking another man's beef is kind of like, eh. But back then, I really felt strongly about life. I don't fuck with them. Why do y'all fuck with them? It should be fuck them. Because it was just, you know, last week in Feld, I said, like, inserting my gang ethos into spaces where this is art. And uh, like I said, I don't, I'm still undecided about that. But, you know, if you don't fuck with them, I don't fuck with them. Um, if you're cool with them, I'm cool with them. That's kind of how my mom is. My brother's the opposite. My brother, if I say fuck you, he's still mad. If there's a rapper, my, my brother still wants to beat up. Um, and, and people from our childhood, he he will take grudge to the house, bro. He'll take, he's taking it with him. And my dad's included, I think, in that. He's taking the fades to the pearly gates. And I respect that as well. Uh, but yeah, that was what I was talking about. But we were just all of us talking about um, our respect. I will be, I think himself said something, help you beat the fool's ass at the train station. We met him at the train station. Thank God it wasn't a cell phone because somebody about to get whooped on. He got in a, a squabble at the train station right before we met him or something, I think. And we were like, man, we was running to like get there. To be like, I don't know if he called, I don't know how we knew. I think that was what he was referencing. And the Anacron, like, yeah, I will be to the individual that ran up on us. Cause that would have been whoo shit. You're talking about three motherfuckers ready to fight back then. So that's kind of what Pals is about. Um, we understood each other. And, you know, to this day, I think. To this day. And uh, the last one is three. Every time I leave the crib, you might think I'm pissed off. But I'm just thinking about these tapes and this weed I need to get off. I love rapping. I love it when the fan tells me that I was snapping. This is NT Dub, gang, fool. Ain't shit changed, and it won't. So when I get the fame, don't look at me strange. Hanging around the same spots. Seeing the same homeboys. Being harassed by the same cops. And I referenced the thong song. And I thought that was clever. Probably my, one of my most clever lines, if you listen to it. Nether Worlds is the bump, bump. But I think I'll say it again. This is like the last song, so play it again. Crack a brew and grab your bong. It's just like the first time, but now sing along. So come on. Yes, you in the car with your friend. Now the world's just the bum, bum. I think I'll sing We're it gonna again. We're going to beat Britney Spears when this album here drops. And I'll take her to the Grammys, then I'll beat them till it pops. Sock and knock some teeth out. I'm down for the game. I'm old as hell, though. And then Anacron comes in with Britney and Britney Spears. And like that's something that doesn't exist in rap anymore is actual groups which is part of why I think Anacron does the work he does in the community. I do providing space. Kids are often criticized for wanting to be on the screens, but they're not spaces for them. There's no more record stores or skate shops, really, to, for the hang skate parks, I think, a little bit. But um, for hip-hop or comic book shops, like, where are you going to meet people of like mind and do shit and create rap groups? There's no rap groups. Everybody's recording in their room. So us trading bars... I took that for granted, but there's not a lot of that now. But we came up on EPMD where there were seamless transitions. And these transitions, like I say, I make a pop reference to Bump Bump. I think I'll sing it again. And then he came in with Britney Spears reference. You know, some people used to come in and rhyme the same words. And we used to start thinking that was corny. But now I just want to see anything like that. It would be great. But uh, yeah, that's Netherworlds. This says 1997. I don't think that was it. Then the Spotify says 2000. Somewhere around there. I was young, 20, 21. I drank Old Style for the first time. And it has to be mentioned that himself was a Chicago scholar. He took me to the South Side and told me Black history. Took me on the the L, like elevated trains. And I'm like, oh shit, I saw this on The Fugitive. Like, took me to the lake. And then we watched fireworks from some condo with the glass, like windows facing the lake. It was amazing, 4th of July. Like lifetime memories I created. Also, like I said, because of just wanting to make music with my friends, creating art with people you love and respect. There's nothing that beats in and going anywhere, regardless of the money. I was sleeping on a Kron's floor, on Justice's floor, trying to make this happen because I loved hip hop. Please, whatever your genre of music, whatever you like, let love for your craft lead you to new places. He, you know, himself explained the architecture and how, like, Chicago is designed on a grid or whatever. When the wind blows, sometimes it's crazy because they've, like, 
wind tunnels and like all these things, like uh, stuff I'll never forget. When I go to Chicago to this day, I still remember things that he told me. But him him being like a, a 20-year-old, 21-year-old black kid, having this knowledge and sharing it with me that I can now share with my kids when we visit Chicago and I can explore further into. It's just amazing. Read, be knowledgeable, create art share ideas, share information, check that information shared by your friends, research it, and then, you know, share more. And, oh, man, for all the young people, um, thank you. And the old people listening to this, thank you. We'll be back next week. I think we're going to go into Almost Famous. And leave comments. Let me know if this is too long. One of my homies, Alyssa, said it could be longer. He doesn't care, so I made it a little longer. I'm, I'm dragging it on, telling more stories. I don't know how this is going. Whatever makes it more pleasurable, I try to adjust, but is kind of, you know, just for me and whoever gives a fuck. Thank you. And uh, Almost Famous. And then into the beginning, I'm trying to wait till I get to that because uh, that's going to be a long one. But um, yeah, I think we'll do Almost Famous next. And the Legends have a new record dropping. I'm not on the record, but I still think everyone should go. I'm not going to be on the tour, but I still think everyone should go support, show love to my brothers. They're going to kill it. I'm sure the album is amazing. Everything I've heard so far has been dope. And there's a new single out right now. Make sure you check it. Letterman's, I think it's called. Peace, y'all. Peace, y'all. Sport all star at 16 sports car. Yep, luck, not a munch. I'm a stroke hard. I'm a boss and a teammate these days. We stay the head of the gang, could never be late. It's a relay laughing, you laughing, dude. Asking who you thinking it was to be slapping fool. CMA varsity, natural aptitude where conscious meets arrogant. Tackle you on the avenue. The demon slayer, the manifester, the multi layer, the non aggressor, the dropout, the dreamer layer, the record breaker, no cop out. When I need some paper, I pull the stops out. My marker's major. Production dangerous. Can you feel the taser? A constant changer. A rearranger. A stranger. A caper.